Okay, perfect. Um, so I wanted to ask you about transitioning the comfort over to taking care of COVID patients. I know that wasn't the original plan. Um, can you tell me a little bit about how that, what that meant for you in terms of what you had to do on the ship, and do you have what you need to make that transition effectively? Well, we originally thought that we were going to use the comfort for some of those high trauma cases like, a, say, a car accident or a stabbing, uh, those kinds of things. And what we found was based on uh, everyone staying at home, and uh, there really was a significant reduction in those kinds of injuries, which is a wonderful thing. Uh, but we also found that there was still a demand signal uh, and a demand to take care of other patients. And so we, we knew we had to adjust fire. And so literally after the last couple of days, we've been getting after this. Uh, the team did a really good job of really studying the ship, <laughs> analyzing the ship, and seeing how do we get after this in a way that allow us to take care of the patients, and even those high-end patients like the trauma victims, whilst at the same time uh, not restricting it to, to non-COVID patients. Uh, and so they've done some, some significant work. A couple things they've done, for example, is uh, many of the beds are actually bunk beds, um, and clearly that's not going to give you the separation you need for COVID patients, so we're not using them anymore. And that's why we went from about 1,000 bed capacity to about a 500 bed capacity. Uh, we've also done some work to uh, kind of isolate some of the areas. It's still, it's a ship, so it's tight, and so the team's working hard to bring as much isolation as we can within the different areas of the ship that they're working. Uh, they've also worked, for example, we've taken the crew off the ship, so instead of the crew uh, berthing on the ship, we brought them to the New York City hotels uh, in order to free up space and capacity there as well, and we built some tents outside of the ship uh, that allow us to do some of the processing, keep a nice separation between all of the patients, uh, and allow us to do the, uh, the, the, the care that we need for the patients in a COVID environment while still being able to bring that high-end care, even surgery. We have operating rooms, the ICU beds. Take full advantage of that, but, but not limiting it to only uh, non-COVID patients. And uh, we're ready for this. We're already executing it. Uh, we had given the order um, and to prepare for this. And once the order from the Commander-in-Chief was given uh, to go uh, execute it, then we didn't waste a, a moment, and we are, we are already operating in this environment now. I think one of the long-running themes of this um, outbreak is the, la the shortage of resources, ventilators, PPE equipment, things like that. Now, you've obviously had to transition fairly quickly to what you're going to do, but do you have what you need? We have everything we need in order to do this. In fact, we had brought ventilators with us. We have about 100 of them on the ship already. Uh, we're using those, of course, uh, for the COVID treatment if, uh, if required. Uh, but we are postured. We have everything we need. Uh, there were a couple things. Uh, for example, when you do surgery on a COVID patient, you actually need a pressurized suit uh, in order to do that. So those are the types of things that we were acquiring, make sure we had. Uh, we're set up. We're ready to go. Uh, we're fully capable and, and uh, are actually already operating in this environment now. Thomas, tell me what you can tell me uh, about the staff member who tested positive. What's his or her status and anything you're able to tell me about that situation? Uh, well, we do have a crew member uh, who had come up positive in COVID. There's no impact to our operations and uh, no impact clearly to the patients. In fact, it was a crew member not related to the medical treatment, but actually one of the ship's crew. Uh, but no impact to operations. We have uh, uh, him isolated, uh, and uh, we expect uh, no impact to our operations. Um, but I, th I think it gets people concerned. I mean, it's obviously you're in a controlled environment. As you said, it's a ship um, and obviously, it's a it's a hospital ship, so it's designed a certain way. It's not like a cruise ship, but people are wondering about that. Could it get out? Are you worried it could get out of control? I mean, you you have to deal with different ventilation systems and things like that. I mean, I think it made people nervous when they heard about a crew member getting testing positive. Yeah, we're highly confident about our ability to uh, work in this environment. Uh, we have the right processes in place. Uh, we've made sure that uh, we are able to operate appropriately and really very similar to the uh, way a high-end hospital would operate with respect to emergency room patients. Uh, when, when they first come in, you don't know whether they're COVID or not COVID. Uh, you have to treat the, the medical trauma uh, that faces uh, the, the, the medical technicians and the doctors. And so that's our first, our first priority is to, one, make sure that we are able to provide the appropriate medical treatment. Uh, we have the right PPE or the protection for our doctors, our nurses, our med techs, uh, so they can do so safely. Uh, but we're, we're ready. Uh, we've been providing life-saving uh, medical capability already, uh, and we'll continue to do that without regard to whether a patient is uh, positive or, or, or not been exposed to the virus yet. The, you know, the Comfort has traveled all over the globe, helping people all over in medical need. You're helping Americans now, and it doesn't happen very often. What does that feel like? 
There's something very special about operating right here at home, whether it's our home and defense mission where we defend this great nation, or whether it's us providing care to our, to our citizens. Uh, it's a very sacred mission set. We're very proud to be part of this whole of America approach. Uh, we feel that uh, we are bringing a very uh, incredibly important capability where it's needed right now across America. But you're fighting a war, obviously, but it's an enemy you can't see, which has got to be a little unusual for you. What do you how do you take that on? It is challenging, and, and we've taken on many enemies, but this, is, uh, this one is a daunting one because, as you mentioned, you can't see it. You can't physically see it. Uh, it brings many challenges, and even our what we call mission assurance is making sure that we maintain our ability to do our core mission sets, our critical mission sets of defending this nation. And so we've had to take a different approach because of that. And we're taking precautions. Uh, we've isolated crews. Uh, we, even within this headquarters here, uh, we maintain our social distancing. Uh, we keep as much separation as possible. But we have to keep fighting. We can't stop. Uh, we, the mission goes on. Uh, and we're finding ways, just like we always adapt, no matter what enemy we face, we're adapting to this enemy, and we will prevail. You have a, such a big area of responsibility outside of the comfort and, you know, that area. Tell me, else, tell me some other things that you want to let us know that the military are doing in other regions and other parts of the country and other areas. What else is going on that we need to know about? As you mentioned, uh, we're, we're focused all over our great nation, and uh, clearly a lot of capability has been pushed towards New York City and, and, and now also to New Jersey and Connecticut. Uh, but we're also involved all over the nation to include for example, we put a hospital up in Seattle. Uh, we have the Mercy in California. Uh, we have a hospital, uh, Navy hospital, that's uh, deployed to, uh, to New Orleans, uh, to Dallas. Uh, we're working closely with the National Response Coordination Center. Pete Gainier, Gainier and I talk often about where is the next area that we need to be able to bring our capability. And so we're looking at a lot of different areas where we will be able to respond. Uh, we're in response to the National Response Coordination Center's priorities, uh, and we go where they need us. Uh, and they're obviously tied in, as are we, to the White House task force to make sure that we're postured. And we're, we are uh, command and control set up all over the nation, whether we go to Alaska, whether we go to the West Coast, whether we go to the northern border or the southern border. Uh, we, we are ready to go wherever our nation needs us. I think those were my questions. Is there anything I didn't ask you that you want to add? Uh, one thing I might talk about is a public-private partnership. Yes. Uh, one of the Tell great things that we've seen it. is a public, yeah, okay. One of the great things that we've seen is a public-private partnership, whether it's the CEOs engaging with the White House task force with the president and the vice president, uh, or whether it's down here at our Northern Command, uh, we see an incredible whole of America approach, which includes our, our commercial companies. And I'll, I'll give an example. Uh, I was approached by Apple executive, uh, Vice President Doug Beck, and he said, hey, we have capability at Apple that we'd like to make available to you. One of the challenges that we were faced with was how do we know when the next hotspot is? How do we analyze the data? Uh, we were able to take some of Apple's engineers and partnering with other companies and really get a fine tune on predictive analysis to use that data in new and innovative ways to determine where it is that we need to put our next level of effort. In addition, one of the things that's unusual for us is we normally employ as a unit. Uh, when we go to New York City, we normally would go with a, a unit that would employ, has a commander, has a leadership, uh, and then the individuals, doctors, uh, nurses, and med techs will do their, their great work. But what one of the demand signals in New York was to scatter to the individual hospitals. And so they asked us to send doctors and technicians and nurses to 11 different hospitals in the Brooklyn and in, uh, in the Bronx and Manhattan and Queens. And they're going to be scattered throughout New York City. We needed a way to keep, keep tabs of them. You know, keep, how's our health? How, how are they doing? Do they have the right PPE? So Apple actually uh, worked with us and we created a bunch of different apps, uh, and we've now issued each of them a device. And so every day, I get a report from every one of them about their health status, how they're doing, do they have the right equipment. Uh, I can actually physically track and tell exactly where they are. Uh, this allows us to keep our command and control and keep tabs on our troops and make sure that we're giving them everything we need. And it's this commercial partnership with Apple uh, that's enabled us to do this. That's really interesting. I don't think we knew about that. So it's something for us to follow up on for possibly another story. But I'm just curious about the people scattered in 11 hospitals. Why? I mean, um, what, what, are they, what are they doing in those hospitals? Well, we find a, as we work with our New York City officials and the state of New York officials, uh, there were multiple areas where they needed assistance. 
One of them is the attrition of their workforce. If you look at all the healthcare workers, they're tired. They've been working hard. Some of them are sick. Uh, they need a break. And so what we were able to do was take 325 doctors, nurses, uh, and respiratory uh, therapists, and we are actually able to bring them directly to the hospital so that some of the doctors, nurses, uh, and therapists could take a break. Uh, and some of them, again, they're sick. They've been exposed to the virus. And so we were able to go directly to the hospitals, provide that medical care, integrate right into the hospital, uh, and, and provide that, that relief, if you will, uh, for the workers that have just been the, the unsung heroes of this overall effort. I think unsung is the right word because I don't believe we sort of knew really that that was happening, but that makes sense and it's a really positive thing. So we'll follow up with your folks who are great, by the way, uh, uh, helping me set this up. You have an amazing staff and uh, right. we'll follow up with them uh, about that. You. I think so too. All right, thank you. <laughs> okay. Thank you, General. All right. Bye. Thanks. Thanks so much. Bye. Bye. Bye.